In ministering to homeless kids, we came across a study by a woman named Ruby Payne, mm -hmm. and some school districts may know of her. A Leaf is studying to use uh, A Leaf is a district where they're starting to use a whole lot of her studies. They're just a marvelous woman who has dedicated years and years and years of research into the effects of different types of poverty. Um, when you hear the word poverty, don't think of financial poverty poor. So similar to how when you hear the word baptism, mm -hmm. you think of water. Well, it doesn't mean water. Bap baptism just means to dip in. So you got to rely on the context to determine into what. And so when you hear the word poverty, we're not necessarily speaking of financial poverty or bankruptcy or no money. Uh, and so she brings these uh, studies of how poverty affects the minds of young people so that school teachers can take control of their classroom and keep their classroom safe. And now uh, a lot of community workers and pastors are starting to see this and say, well, this can help in my church because adults are affected in the same way. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to emotional poverty, uh, was a, is a new book that she released, I think uh, maybe about 18 months ago that I uh, have started studying. And before I start, I just want to say this, that I am not a certified trainer in Ruby Payne's material. Mm -hmm. I am a lover of her science and a lover of her teaching, and it is something that has blessed my organization. And so anytime I get a chance to talk about it, uh, I take that opportunity. So uh, I'm going to go over the, some of the things that she has talked about that has really blessed our organization in the understanding of emotional poverty. Uh, last time we just talked about understanding poverty when I was here about this same time last year, I think it was March or February last year. I want to explain what emotional poverty is. So first, emotional poverty is not a clinical disorder. You're not going to find this in the, um, what is it, DSM-5? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be there. I believe it should just by studying Ruby Payne's material. Uh, and Ruby Payne uh, was a teacher in Houston. She, she taught in Aldine for, for years and years and years and uh, did a 30-year study into all of this. And it's not a clinical disorder. However, what she has come to understand emotional poverty is, is a unregulated and unintegrated brain, which is what we're going to get into today. Uh, again, out of all the things she teaches, I'm going to show you guys the things that have impacted our uh, organization the most in hopes that as you mentor and go into your schools and school church relationships, you can understand some of the things you're going to see. Um, it is um, attachment and bonding uh, is not secure, which means there is no... Um, secure attachment to someone who is, has the ability to emotionally and phys uh, uh, physically secure you in any type of way. Uh, your emotions are not attached to a solid person. So you see someone have blow-ups, what are you going to do? You're going to have blow-ups. Mm -hmm. There's no attachment there. Your inner self is underdeveloped and dominated by deep hurts. This is an interesting part of the study. What she talks about here is in your youth, if you have experienced an emotional jolt, an emotional trauma, your inner self and your emotional age stops at the moment of that hurt if it has not been counseled or consulted or if you have not been helped in that area. Uh, and I have seen this. This understanding really helped us in our ministry in dealing with homeless children. Um, we have understood by just changing the way that we minister to them that we're dealing with someone who may be 18 physically, but when we started changing the way we spoke to them, we found out that this dude is really seven years old. And it's serious stuff when you finally get to get them to start speaking and talking, uh, the, things that, that, the, the, the things that come out. And then the next thing is uh, external environment makes you feel less than and separate from. And so in emotional poverty, we're not going to talk about this part of it today, but she makes a statement that says, uh, in emotional poverty, there are just as many, if not more, children in affluence that are experiencing emotional poverty than there are children that are in poverty. They just go about it different ways. You don't see the same uh, outbreak and lashing out with children in affluence experiencing emotional poverty as you do with children experiencing real poverty that are going through emotional poverty. It may look different, but it's the same thing. And so she talks about that in the study here. And so uh, one of the other things she talks about that I want to just hit on really quickly uh, before we go to the next slide is uh, the difference between uh, male and female, the male and female brain. And she, in this book and in this teaching, in explaining emotional poverty, uh, the difference between the male and female brain has to do a large, large part with blood flow. And the female brain, 
the blood flow is mostly across the two hemispheres. And in the male brain, it is stuck in one hemisphere to the other. And what she talks about is if you are mentoring children and you are mentoring young children, uh, and those of you that mentor adults, remember this because it doesn't change. In young children, if a female has had an emotional jolt, they want to talk quicker than a young male wants to talk. The problem with the school system in her study, she says, is that when a young boy experiences an emotional joke, he hit me, he stole my lunch, he gets in trouble for not wanting to talk. He physically cannot control not wanting to talk. His brain is only functioning on one side at that moment. And according to the study, um, I forget the scientist's name that does the brain study, but uh, he did brain scans of children going through fresh emotional uh, trauma. And in the female brain, both sides of the hemisphere have lit up because of this emotional trauma. In the male brain, it took three hours from the emotional trauma to travel from the emotional center, which is here, over to the speech center, which is on the other side of the brain. Three hours. Which explains why men mostly want to sit down and process. Mm -hmm. But let a young child do this in school, and they're going to get suspended. They're going to because they won't talk. Mm -hmm. And so she talks about this, and we've applied a lot of these studies to the young men in our house why they won't talk, and it stopped us from forcing. No, you got to talk. You got to say something. And now we understand why they won't talk. It's something that most times they literally cannot control. So I want to say that. So emotional. Um, Emotional poverty are these things, and the problem is the brain cannot and or does not control the emotional response. Now, this is this has to do with that where we're dealing with unintegrated and unregulated, and this has to do with this one right here, and this is what we're going to spend a lot of time on today. When you're in emotional poverty, you have an unregulated and unintegrated brain, and by the time we're done today, you're going to understand exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. However, when you have an unregulated and unintegrated brain, you your brain cannot and does not control emotional response, and there is a reason why. And that is because your brain processes 200 to 5,000 5, times faster thoughts. When you experience emotional trauma, your instincts set in. And if you have not had an attachment relationship, a healthy attachment relationship, if you have not been taught to process emotion through your childhood years, by the time you were three years old, and we'll talk about this, uh, the, the hand model of your brain, by the time you are three years old, the part of your brain that is formulated to help you process emotions is set. And then during over different portions of your life, it can be... Uh, changed and she says reset, but at three years old it is set and it sets the framework for how you are able to control your emotions for the rest of your life at three years old. And so since emotion is processed so much faster, if a child has not been taught to think, the first thing you're going to see is emotional response. That's the first thing that's going to come out of a child. And the thing that we have to think about as teachers and mentors it will come across to us if we're not understanding this as disrespect. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing we want to do is write the child up. Mm -hmm. And that may not be the correct course of action to write the child up. That child may not, literally may not have the physical ability to be able to control what he or she is feeling at that moment. But we have to be taught to understand that. And it may not be, it may not be necessary to write that child up. It may a better response may be to try to understand why is this child lashing out. I'll give you an example, and I'll give you this one for free. Um, <laughs> uh, in, our, in our ministry home, uh, when we first started, I mean, I grew up in a military family. My dad was a drill sergeant, and so you can imagine the type of regimented life we grew up living. Uh, and I'm well-adjusted to my emotions. I mean, you know, had a father and a mother at home, well-adjusted to emotions and all those types of things. So when, I, when we open up this ministry house, I'm thinking, Oh, this, 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock, bed made, all this stuff. And so I quickly found out that the more rules were, the more rules we had in that home and the more punishments were dealt because of the breaking of those rules, the more rebellion we would have. And I was just like, why? Why can't you just do this? This is the rule of the house. And when I understood this, I understood that they've never been given 
the ability to formulate an integrated brand or a regulated brand is completely unregulated. And so the way the changes that we made was we used a system called the box system. And what we taught them was every decision you make has a consequence. And you teach them to think future thought. And uh, I think we'll cover that a little bit in some of these slides here. And so one of the things is uh, you break curfew. The choice to break curfew is an automatic. You are also choosing this. Mm -hmm. So understand your choice to break curfew is your choice also to lose internet privilege. I'm not taking it from you. You chose it when you chose to break curfew. And so that's a, a, a system that she uses to help them think so that when the emotional response comes, they can understand, wait a minute, he's not doing me wrong. I chose this. And so those are some things that she uses there. So now we're going to get into this integrated, <coughs> uh, unregulated and unintegrated brain. Why do children explode and why do they get out of control? And we're going to use a model that uh, Ruby Payne did not uh, discover this. She did not create this. This was created by a scientist, I forget his name, uh, and it may be on the bottom of the slide here. But I'm going to teach it to you guys so that you can understand why it's called unregulated and un unintegrated brain. And this is, a, this is actually a physical condition. We're not talking about you know, magical dragon. This isn't imaginary. This is literally, physically what is happening in the, in the brain of a child who is at an, at an emotionally poverty state. Okay, and so I want to explain this to you guys. If you hold up your hand, and uh, these slides are a little small. I can go through here with you. But if you look at your hand like this, this is your spinal cord here, okay, which represents your spinal cord. The palm of your hand is your brain stem, which is all of your involuntary systems in the palm of your hand here, okay? And so, uh, you know, this controls hunger, arousal, sleep, awake, your fight or flight responses, survival mode, okay? So one of the things we're going to look at here in the latter, latter parts of these slides is if, when you understand these fingertips here, if a child has not been taught how to integrate all the parts of their brain, and I say taught because they, they're supposed to be taught this by their parents. If they've not been in a healthy environment where they can understand emotional life, they'll always function from right here. There will always be survival instinct. There will always be fight or flight. Their emotions will not be attached to anything good or bad. It will just be survival. I have to be angry because that's how I survive. I have to fight because that's how people will leave me alone. It's strictly instinct. This is the basis of motivation, uh, food, shelter, re reproduction. It works with the limbic area uh, to get you to act. And so that's this part of the brain here. And um, so it controls all those various centers. The next part here will be your thumb. And that's here. This is the, 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 the limbic region of the brain if you use your thumb here. And so right now you have your brain stem. This is... Uh, um, the uh, the brain stem of your brain. This is the limbic region. So if you fold it, it we're gonna end up looking like this soon. Okay. okay. So this controls and creates emotion. It uh, evaluates situations, good or bad. And we highlighted this here. Or she highlighted this here because the emotions we choose, either toward or away, according to the uh, meaning that we assign situations. Now this is where it becomes important as mentors. Many of the children that you may mentor, I know that I mentor, the only way that they get these associations is by the brief few hours I spend with them in the week. They are not going home to a healthy parent. They're just not. And so they're not getting these associations. They're not getting what associates, what is a true healthy good emotion? What is a true healthy bad emotion? By the time you school teachers get your child on Monday, they would have spent, what, 60-something hours away from the safety of a school where their parents put them in front of an iPad and never talk to them on the weekend, give them a pack of Roman noodles, don't cook over the weekend, and by the time they get to your school, they're back with a teacher who they accidentally may call mom sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why that slips out of a child's mouth, or dad. Um, there's a reason why that slips out of a child's mouth. And so this is important that we understand uh, sometimes those uh, those emotions and those connections will come from someone who cares for them. This is the area that creates relation, relationships and emotional attachments. It regulates cortisol. That's going to be important. Remember that this area 
regulates cortisol because we're going to understand uh, the, the result of emotional poverty in a few minutes. Okay, when we are stressed and puts our entire system on alert, it can be sensitized and fragmented by, by, uh, by trauma. And that's this region of the brain. Now we're going to begin to close the brain. Okay, and we're going to talk about now, um, oh, some more limbics. Okay, so this creates your memories, your emotions, um, and it's an important part of the fear response. So uh, emotional states can be created without consciousness. We may act on them without awareness. Now this is Siegel. Siegel is the one who created this, uh, this hand model. And that's why I say by the time you are three years old, that area of your brain that controls your emotions is set. By that age, uh, the very first emotional thoughts you have are set in stone. Uh, my mother has been good to me, so I want to see her. Or my mother hits me, I cry when I see her. And so then you begin to already associate a feminine person as a bad person. Or if your father has beaten you at three, you associate a fear to men. Or a fear to a certain looking type of man, or whatever it is. You associate these fears. You associate the fear of heights if you're Dad made you jump off a, a, a thing into a pool or something. All of a sudden, now you don't want to, you're afraid of water. Those types of things, okay? Integrates experiences, body sensations, and as we age, uh, the hippocampus uh, weaves the basic forms of emotional and perceptual memory into factual and autobiographical rec uh, recollections. Now, this becomes important because you can be, again, you can be 18 years old, and you're still looking at certain things as you're seven. Still, and so uh, the thing that the, the the thing that has been very beneficial to us is that once we start realizing where the child in our in our care has been hurt, we're able to understand now how do we now get them away from that age and grow them emotionally. And as you mentor your kids, you're going to find the same thing. All right. So now you have this. So now you have the brainstem. Uh, which is here, you have the, the, the limbic region, and now you have the cortex, okay? So you're closing up the brain, and now you're looking like this, and you have this part of the brain. So uh, it's the back of the hand. This covers the brain and moves the brain, uh, moves the brain to thoughts, ideas, and creates its own representations, and it allows us to think about thinking. This is where you get the part where you understand integration and regulation. If a child has not been taught to think, they have no ability to control their emotion. Now this becomes important for school districts because we are, we are writing up kids and sending them to ALC and sending them to SAC and sending them to detention and they really have no physical ability to control all of the things that they are feeling. All they know is to lash out. All they know is to have a tantrum tantrum in your classroom. And we're gonna understand a little bit about why that is in a, in a, in a, in a, in a second. All right. Um, so here's the prefrontal cortex, and this is the two middle fingers here. And this gives you your sense of time and your sense of self. Uh, the middle prefrontal region controls impulsivity, has insight and empathy, and uh, enacts moral judgment. And again, this has to deal with now our integration and regulation. Um, this is when all of these things are missing in the mind of a child, when they don't have those connections in the brain. This is why you can get children who you would look at them and ask them, who raised you? A pack of wolves, like you know, you, you don't understand why they can treat someone a certain way. In their the connections are literally not there in their brain. They can be made though. Uh, once you know, once once these things are missing, it's not that they never can be created. It's that someone has to recognize it and create it. Um, a lot of schools now, uh, Ruby Payne and her team are going around the going around the schools. They have something called emotional triage, and if you know about her her work. She's able to go into emotional triage and um, bring the school's attention to kids who could be potential shooters in schools. Mm -hmm. And she diagnosed the Santa, Fe, the Santa Fe shooter. She had diagnosed that situation. Mm -hmm. And it was sad to see that she, she knew about that. Um, and I'm not sure what all was able to be done, but um, she teaches schools how to do emotional triage because this is what happens, a Santa Fe situation, when they unpacked that kid's manifesto, uh, they saw everything that she had said about that child was true. And so I don't know how much, uh, I don't even know if she knew ahead of time, it may have been after the fact. All right, so 
uh, here it is in poverty. So now we are talking about poverty. So now we are talking about a child who is in a situation where they are in poverty. So now we're talking about uh, the lack of a mother or father, the lack of a healthy home environment, the lack of food, anything. So it's, it's underdeveloped. All of the prefrontal cortex area, all the area we spoke about is underdeveloped. They don't have the plan to even think about thinking. They are always in survival skill. For those of you that mentor or minister to kids who are in poverty, you know if you've ever tried to feed them, nine times out of ten, they won't finish the meal. Because they know that if they eat it all, they won't have any later. If you start paying attention to this, you'll see it. They'll stuff some in their bag. They'll eat half, save half. Notice this kind of stuff. This is a child that they're already giving you a sign that they cannot think of. They're in instinct mode. They're in survival mode. And that also tells you that, that if this child has an emotional trigger, they're going to blow up. They're going to have an emotional response that if you're not trained to understand it, you're going to perceive it as disrespect or danger. So... Uh, this Siegel guy did a study. He says the, the prefrontal cortexes in this environment of 10, 11, and 12-year-olds uh, look like the, uh, the victims of, of adult stroke. And the environment uh, of poverty provides few opportunities for development just because of the situation that they're in. And we're talking about, in this case, situational poverty, which is most of the uh, children that I mentor to, okay? All right, so... Now we're going to talk about the blow-up, okay? And then we're going to talk about common. So you remember that image of the brain. This is the full image of the brain. You have that emotional region here. Then you have all the things that control that here. This is an integrated brain. So when I have an emotional response, I'm thinking, if I act out in front of these people, mm -hmm. I'm going to lose my witness. They're going to, mm -hmm. they're going to think, man, I thought, I thought better of him. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to invite him to come speak again, you know. I think about those things because I was raised in a great environment. My dad taught me. My mom taught me. I, I was able to observe and ask questions. And so in my brain, connections were made that covered my emotional center. So when that emotion processes, I'm able to, because the brain is integrated, to think. Well, when children don't have these connections in the brain, here's what it looks like when they think. Their brain is completely unintegrated and it is unregulated. Their emotions are not regulated by any thought. So if you uh, mentor a child and that child acts up in your mentor session or in your classroom and you tell them, I said sit down. Mm -hmm. Well to them, they may or may not do it and when they don't do it, nine times out of 10, they'll blow it back at you in front of everyone. Because there's nothing in their brain that gives them the connection, I better do what he or she says because I'm going to be in trouble. That's not the thought that they're able to think. Everything comes directly out of the emotional center because their brains have not formed the connections to have integrated thought in them. So if we know that we're going to be dealing with children like this, if we know, if you can know that as you're dealing with children like this, you're not dealing with uh, a situation with a bad child. One of the biggest learnings, if I can just say this really quickly, and I don't want to eat up all my time saying this, let me just say it quickly. If, if I can say one of my biggest teachings in mentoring kids. When I first started mentoring kids, uh, I wanted to mentor encourageable children. I've always had a heart for kids who, the, who other people see as bad, always. And so when I first started mentoring, uh, I started at Youngblood, and I'm still at Youngblood Intermediate. Um, I came and told the principal, I want to conquer the school, and I was going like this, and give me all the kids who have the most write-ups. And she did. <laughs> and um, uh, I think I ended up with like, 18 or 19 kids who had the most write-ups, always in SAG, always in ALC, and they beat me up pretty bad. And I, I finished my course, I finished my race. Out of that, uh, out of that class, I ended up probably with a solid 10. We stopped, we stopped the suicide, we stopped the school shooting, we stopped the bullying uh, event there. Uh, but one of the things I learned in that situation, even before I came across her thing, I learned that these kids live off of emotion every day. I'm going to show you in a second here that there's a drug released called cortisol when we are highly emotional. It is, it is addictive. And so when kids are always angry and always emotional and always blowing up and always have that, I don't care, I don't care what you say, I don't get all this kind of stuff, they don't know it. But all they want is another hit of cortisol. That's what they want. They want another shot of that drug, cortisol. And so I began to understand a little bit about their inability to control it. They had no idea they couldn't control it. 
And so that's what really started me trying to seek ways to connect with these children in a way that was around or went around their inability to control their actions. And the first suicide we stopped uh, was out of that first group. The first suicide we stopped was a young girl who was cutting. And she wasn't even in, even in my group. One of, the, one of the young ladies in my group brought her to me. And by the grace of God, all I heard God tell me was just listen to her, don't talk. And so I started listening to her in this class session and I just I kept asking her, how do you feel? I don't know why I did. I just did. I, I did not, well, I wasn't led by the Lord to explain anything. Mm -hmm. uh, all I heard was just let her talk, let her vent the emotion. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I was able to convince her to not take her life. And we took her to, of course, I had to take her to a counselor and they took it from there. But we stopped the school shooting the same way in that same group of kids. And so this is important uh, as you go around doing that. And if I had went in that classroom, mm -hmm and only thought about, you better respect me because I'm the adult, mm -hmm. I would have lost that entire group of kids. And trust me, I could have went in there saying that because they were rambunctious, they were all over the place, uh, they were disrespectful in, in, the, in the mindset of, you know, don't, don't talk while I'm talking, they were all of that. Uh, but for some reason, uh, the Lord just gave me the mindset to just try to understand them. And so that, that began this course. So if you know you're going to be dealing with these kids, I want to show you some techniques. If you're going to be, if you know you're going to be dealing with an unintegrated and an unregulated brain, some techniques to, to calm children down. In this, we're going to talk about D, uh, A, and D. All of these are important, uh, but I'm going to talk about A and D. So A is water. The very first and most important thing you give a child who is having a bad emotional response is water. Water metabolizes cortisol. The water to drink. Water to drink. Not, not, not like the Chinese torture technique. Yeah, no, like no, 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 no. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> water to drink. Water metabolizes cortisol. If you give them water to drink in about five to ten minutes, you will end their emotional response because the water flushes the cortisol out of their system. And I'm telling you, I've seen this in the ministry house right now. We keep, a, we keep, we go to Sam's and buy the the 45 pack of water. We keep them on deck, keep them on stock all the time, all the time, all the time. And they think I'm just trying to keep them healthy, but I'm pouring them kids with water all the time, oh, especially when they first come, because uh, when they first come, they're not used to, especially not used to a man who is used to being emotional, a man that loves them. They're not used to a man who, when they make a mistake, sits them down and asks them, explain, explain the mistake. They're used to a man that wants to, you know, get at them. And so when they first come in, their emotional response is, you being fake, you lying, you going to leave, all this kind of stuff. And so drink some water while we talk. They have no idea what I'm doing, you know. Have a, you know, uh, be mad. Have a, I'll drink some water with you. And you can literally see five or ten minutes go by. You can see the end. It's, they have no idea that they're metabolizing the cortisol out of their system, but they are. Yes, ma'am. It reminds me, um, I used to be a behavior specialist for a project class, and um, I would be dealing with mm -hmm. children that are having these sorts of episodes, and uh, I would take them to the water fountain, and they were like crying hysterically yeah. or really mm -hmm. angry. I would just say, come get, go get some water. But yeah. in my mind, I was just thinking the water was a distraction. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know yeah. that the science behind this yeah. was that the cortisol was being pushed out. But they out. would calm down. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So that's so fascinating. Yeah, every time. And uh, it, it, it works. I'm telling you guys, it works. And, and you'll begin to see, it, it takes a few minutes. But it flushes it right out, mm -hmm. and they go back to being calm. And you need to remember this, especially with, with boys, because it takes them longer to want to talk. They may calm down, but remember, physically, their brains, they don't even know what to say. And all they know is, I'm feeling something. Mm -hmm. And they may take a little longer uh, for them to even develop the words to want to say, all they know is, I'm mad. <laughs> or all they know is, is, he took my phone. But they won't understand how to explain the emotion behind it. So it's, it's uh, important to understand that. So then the look up. So, okay, why look up? So God made our brains so awesome. So for his reasons, God's reasons, I don't know why, but I think our bodies are awesome. Where you direct your eyes, access, now this is uh, uh, Siegel. This is science from Siegel, uh, the gentleman who made the hand model. And I forget another scientist. Um, 
Where you direct your eyes accesses various parts of your brain. When you direct your eyes up, you are accessing visual sensors in your brain. When you look forward, you are accessing auditory centers of your brain. However, when you look down, when you look down, you are accessing emotional centers of your brain. Go back to your schools, go back to the children you mentor, and just look for yourself. When they are having an emotional episode, nine times out of 10, their faces are down. Nine times out of 10, they're looking down. They're banging down, they're looking down, they're stomping away down. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get a hold of this child and just have them look up, have them do an exercise up, or tell them to sing a song or write. Uh, in, in Ruby's teaching, she, she tells them, get them to write words with their eyes on the ceiling. Anything to get them to look up. Because in looking up, they don't know it, you know it. They are shutting off access in their brain physically. I cannot believe the science behind this stuff. But they are, they are shutting off access physically to the emotional response in their brain. You're cutting off the, um, the creation of more cortisol, and you're ending the episode, and now we can deal with the words you want to say. And so if you can get them to look up and draw, draw a word or, or, or you know, count the towels, something creative to get them to look up. It may be hard with older kids because they're going to want to know why, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, but younger, younger kids, you can, especially if, a, if you have a relationship with them, you can get them to look up. Anything to not get them to look down because they are opening up direct access. And, and why the Lord wired our brains like this, I don't know. Uh, but he did. And he blessed these scientists to be able to, um, to, be able to understand uh, this by doing brain scans when our eyes are averted to different locations and the areas of our brain that light up. You know, we, we can look at this. The areas of our brain that light up when our eyes are averted to certain directions. And so looking up, you're, you are uh, uh, creating a visual memory and um, cutting off the emotional center of that, of that brain. Okay, and so um, I have a few minutes left. I want to talk about, now that you have these uh, calming techniques, I want to talk about what will create this bad behavior. And it's something called self-construction. Now, this, this, is, this is what will cause both a regulated and integrated brain or an unregulated and unintegrated brain. And it's called self-construction. And this is a set of beliefs, feelings, and behaviors about the self that form the uh, perspective from which individuals construct meaning. Self-constructions make up the unique lens through which each individual sees the world, and this is from Sanji, um, sees the world. Um, in fact, the brain processes information about the world, gives it meaning, according to how it constructs itself. This is why you want them to look up. And uh, if you have a relationship with them, they're in that moment. They know I am with you now. And you cut off the, across the um, uh, creation of more cortisol. They are, now, they are now physically with you because they're here with you. They're, they're accessing the visual centers of the brain and they're connecting an emotion with you. And if you develop these relationships, you may already have them. You may already have these relationships where a kid would get angry and I just want to talk to I just want to talk to Pastor Paris. I, I don't want to talk to no one, I don't want to talk to them. That's because there is a emotional attachment to whatever's happening to them. That is a healthy thing. It can be a crutch if you don't know how to handle it, but it's a healthy thing for that child, for you to be, for you to help them through that situation. Okay. So here's that. And then uh, I want to talk about a strong inner self and weak inner self. This is an integrated brain. If you can help a child to see themselves as capable, productive, a problem solver, a learner, a nurturer, compassionate to self and others, you will help integrate their brain. These are the things that create that cover for their emotional centers. Okay? This, is, this may be how they come to us as. They have a weak inner self. Their brain is not integrated. It is not regulated. All they are is just an emotional young person. And they see themselves as a victim, needy, uh, they're harmful and destructive, hurting and damaged. And this last slide I want us to look at, is, it says this, and this is very, um, very important. Uh, I'm gonna skip this one. Oh, we can look at this one real quickly. Uh, and here's, a, here's inner strength and inner hurt. So this, remember I showed you the slide with the integrated brain? These are the things that, um, uh, we can do to help them with those feelings. We can make them feel valued, uh, lovable. 
How do you make a child feel lovable when they've just grown up in your class? And that's what becomes important is, is strengthening them. Make writing them up the last thing you have to do. Even if they've just disturbed the whole class, let them know, I understand what that feels like. Now you're disturbing the class. I understand what that feels like, but let's talk about this. Because what you're doing is you're really deciding to go to detention. And I don't want that for you. So let's let's calm down for a minute. Look up or drink a glass of water, you know, and, and let's let's get you back right. And so you can do those situations and they'll they'll come to understand, at least at school, Miss So and so or Mr. So and so loves me. And you want to integrate their brain. Most of these children are not getting it at home. And then of course, these are the things that create inner hurts. How many times do we send a bad kid to the corner of the classroom? If they can't cooperate at this table of four, we move them to the back at their own table. And we as teachers, and I'm not a teacher, but I'm just saying as teachers, we are helping their unintegrated brain and we are helping uh, their de uh, um, de deregulated brain not get any better. We're actually helping it get worse when we send them by themselves. We make them feel unimportant, unattractive. Mm -hmm. You're... You are, and we are creating a classroom that is less than and separate from. They don't feel valued. They don't feel misunderstood because instead of asking them, maybe in a one-on-one, -on -one, what's going on, we don't seem to understand anything. The first thing we do is go to detention. And they don't, no one understands them. And so in the study, um, here's what Ruby Payne has come to understand, and here's what I've come to understand, and that is this. And here's the last slide. We will engage behavior that enforces our inner self, whether good or bad. Whether good or bad. Your kids that come to your mentoring session, your kids that come to their class, if their inner self, if they say, I'm a bad, you know, these kids cuss now, so I'm not going to say it, but <laughs> I'm a bad so-and-so, I'm a bad so-and-so, and they're going to act however they see themselves in their inner self. That is how they're going to act. And we as the adults, we as their caregivers, we as their parents, we as their teachers, as their pastors, or whoever they see us as, we have to be the people that see what, see how they see themselves and say, how do I shift this child from having a very, very weak inner self to changing it to a strong inner self? I'll tell you a story of a young man we have in our home now. I just called you about him. We have a young man who is going through this abusive situation with his grandmother and, and his sisters there. And, uh, we had a situation where we had called Ashley, and Ashley is a large reason why we know a lot of the CPS laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we used to call her probably once a week or twice a week, like, hey, we got a situation. Uh, this young boy uh, made us aware of a situation that he came out of, his sister was still in. And so we called Ashley and let her know we need to do something because he, we just saw these text messages from his sister, so we need to do something about this. And so we told him what we were going to do. And all of a sudden, when we told him, he just went into this darkness, this deep darkness. And it took us a minute to understand what's going on. I thought you wanted your sister to be free. And all of a sudden now, you're not eating. You're cussing at everybody in the house. Uh, you know, you know, you know, you're not supposed to do this in the house. But help me understand why you're saying these things. Uh, one night, he didn't come home. And we found out he was snuck in his grandmother's house and was there with his grandmother and was like, how, how can we call now? They're going to know you were there. And it, it kind of lessens our case against her for your sister. Mm -hmm. So uh, he comes back home the next day and he knows that not coming home is like an automatic, you know, check on something. He knows this. And so he comes home and we ask him, uh, what happened? What are you thinking? What's going on? Instead of lashing out at him. And so he says, in his own words, and I'm not going to say the words he said, but in his words, he said how, how sucky, think about 2020 was, right? <laughs> how sucky of a person he is to leave his sister mm -hmm. in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, he, he started talking about how bad of a grandson he was mm -hmm. because he, for some reason, feels like it's his fault to do all these things. Now he exhibited that by treating us bad mm -hmm. and going back and treating the grandmother good. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So we had to sit him down and explain to him, the way you treat us is not gonna stop us from loving you. you the, this house was here before you got here. It'll be here 
after you leave. We are here to help you in this situation. How do we help your sister? And how do we help you not continue to feel the feelings you're feeling? Because he, he, I mean, he had just went into this, just fogginess, okay? And so that first night he came home, we probably stayed up with him probably until 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, just him talking. He had gotten home and didn't talk for about an hour and a half. And I told him, we're going to stay up until you're ready to talk, and you're ready to come in here and talk to us. Came in there, so I just started talking. And by the time he was done talking, we had a, a list of things on the paper that we wanted to ask him about. Why does this make you feel this way? Why does that make you feel that way? And by the time we were done dealing with his weak inner self, let me go back here. By the time we had figured out what was going on with him, what he really was a, what he really was experiencing was he was experiencing being ignored, he was experiencing being misunderstood, and he was experiencing being unimpo unimportant. The things that his grandmother said them said to him and did with him and not feeding him and all those things we found out that these are the things that he was experiencing so the first thing we did when we understood that was help us understand how you feel about that and how can we make you feel important and not ignored how did you want us to notice you I mean we're not asking him like we're a waiter you know like how can we please you but this is just how I'm communicating to you by the time we were done with him he you know, the next few days or so, he came out of this fogginess, and he's at the house now, and he's he's joined the base, rejoined the baseball team, um, and he's uh, doing really well. And I want to share that story with you because it would have been easy for him to be removed from that program had we not understood the inability of his brain to process an emotional hit. And adults go through this too. Mm -hmm. Adults that have not been addressed of an inner hurt, mm -hmm. think about the ways we treat, think about the ways husbands and wives treat each other. Think about the ways you treat your brothers and sisters or your coworkers. You may be dealing with a coworker who literally does not have the ability to control that initial feeling. And so what you see is an unintegrated brain. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave you to this. Ruby Payne says this several times through her whole uh, series. She says, if you're dealing with a child who has an emotional response because of an unintegrated, unregulated brain. She, he flashes at you like this, and your first response is to allow your emotions to flash out. Mm -hmm. Now you have a room with two mm -hmm. unintegrated and unregulated brains, mm -hmm. and what good can come from that? Mm -hmm. That's what she asked several times in her teaching. There's nothing good that can come from that. You have to be the one to not get offended when this child does this, you have to be the one to take control of that situation. You have to be the one to recognize this child is going through something, and I can take it, what he or she is doing. Now, if there's rules in the classroom, of course. There's things you have to go through, of course. Uh, but our job as, as a church school partnership is to, is to be there to minister to them. I want to stop now. I'm going my time just a little bit and see if there's any questions about some of this um, material that we went over. Again, I only went over the part of the brain. I wanted to just share that with you. Uh, but I do know a whole lot of this, uh, a whole lot of this material I can answer some questions if you have any. She mentions in her, in this series, in the teaching, she mentions, you know, if you have a classroom, just like this classroom, how many is in here? Oh, it's 11? Mm -hmm. Think about this. There's technically more than 11 people in here. Because with me, I brought with me the stress that's in my life. Whether that's between me and my wife or me and my kids, let's say that's three people. So now instead of 11, there's, there's 14 or 15 now. And what if you're bringing stuff in? What if you're bringing stuff in? By the time all of us are in this room, we are bringing in here with us people that have added to our emotional stress. And if we're going to, if we're, as she, she teaches, if we're going to improve our work environment amongst adults, mm -hmm. someone in that environment has to say, mm -hmm. there's a reason why you just responded to me that way. Mm -hmm. So let's, let, let me not respond equal, mm -hmm. and let me be the one to give you room to process that emotion. Mm -hmm. there, there has to be someone in a work environment amongst the adults. Someone has to come to the conclusion, you may, what if, what if, what if one of you got beat this morning? And you're coming in this room with a fake smile, and then you give me an attitude 
I don't know what happened to you this morning, but if I'm not equipped to say, okay, something's up, I'm going to, you know, lash, lash back out. And so we have to understand that about each other. And she has, she spends about 10 minutes talking about that in an environment that, remember, this stuff just isn't about kids. Emotional poverty goes for adults too. And uh, we can go through seasons of our life where our brains are unintegrated and unregulated. And you bring that stuff to work. You know, you could be going, any one of us can be going through a very difficult time with children or with relationships. You still got to come to work. You got to pay bills. You still have to come to work. You still have to deal with people at your job. And uh, just because someone at your job is, is bearing a bad attitude or something doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's about you. That person could have just had the worst morning of their life or the worst month of their whole life. And it's up to us who understand science like this to give them room to go through that. Yes, especially um, especially if they're over three. Because like she says here, by three years old, kids have already set emotional responses to almost everything they're gonna come across. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, uh, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, my, my, one of my uh, staff members for my nonprofit, she drives a black uh, Kia Optima. And one of the young men that mm -hmm. stays in my home the grandmother that abused him, the one I just got finished talking about, she drives a black Kia Optima. So one of my staff members came to the house. He's looking out the window. All he sees is the car. Mm -hmm. That's it. And <laughs> like this, I'm like, what, 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 what? You know, I'm, I don't know what is going on. And so I just grab him like this, and I take him to the back. I'm like, what, what, what's going on? He's a... Uh, <laughs> he's just pointing out the window and I'm like it's just a black car mm -hmm. and so she comes in the house and by the time I calm him down he's telling me my grandmother's here my grandmother's here I'm like no that's Miss Nikki mm -hmm. and no my grandmother's here my grandmother's here mm -hmm. now you know if I'm not trained in this you know you got to go bro. you got to go to some psych mm -hmm. hospital you got you know but you know we know I train all my staff on this stuff so Nikki knows this, and so she comes, she says, look, here's the alarm to my car, push the button. Just, you'll see, this is my car, push the button. And he pushes the button, and in the matter of 30 seconds, it's like it never happened. I'm telling you, it's like it never happened. So foster, if you're fostering a child, to me, it's, it's almost, it should be necessary in my mind. Because you never know what you're going to come across. You never know what an emotional trigger can be for a child who's coming in your home that's over three. You never know that. It could be 90 days in and that child is good, but all of a sudden you take off your shoe and you hold it a little too long. Mm -hmm. What if that flashes a memory for that child that got beat with a shoe? Mm -hmm. You know, Then you gotta figure out what to do. And I actually, about four or five years ago, I actually had to uh, come before my church and repent to them mm -hmm. that the things that they were telling me they were going through just fast and pray mm -hmm. I had to, about five years ago I had to stand up in front of my church and I say I had to because that's how serious God hit me with this information mm -hmm. and I had to tell them I was sorry for not paying more attention to the things that they were bringing to me as their shepherd mm -hmm. as their pastor because this these things are real man they're real. And even though God is all powerful and God is omnipotent, and yes, He can heal you in the blink of an eye, uh, there's science behind this stuff. And and there's nothing wrong with being in front of a person, a counselor, who knows how to deal with your brain physically as well as God dealing with you spiritually. And so uh, the way I've done it in my church is all my leaders, the leaders who help me counsel people and deal with people, they understand the power of prayer. But they also understand the power of dealing with a person one on one. So if they're counseling a person and their child not to agree with this parent who just called their child demon, uh, Satan's child, you know, mm -hmm. no, let's, let's figure out where this child, let's figure out where they are, let's figure out what has happened to them because something has happened to them, and let's figure out the best course of action. And so that's how we've addressed it in my church and in my leadership. Is um, you know, you're not going to find this in Proverbs. You're not going to find this in, in yeah. Psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean it's not right. That doesn't mean it's not in some way God's will for us to know this. Mm -hmm. Because it still provides healing. Mm -hmm. 
and some people are in motion. I say I think where that would come into play is kind of like what you hit on. If they trust you only, yeah, and not me, let's say, they may voice it to you in your moment at my campus. Right. Yeah. And so in that moment, you'll have to de-escalate and, and let a school personnel know. But that, that's where I see it most happening mm -hmm. because we have had that happen where the kid will talk to the mentor and not a school personnel. Yeah. But I, I don't know if you had something yeah. different to say. Yeah, I want to answer that question in two ways. One, um, I can speak of how we do our mentoring and, and because we're coming into the school, like you said, for 30 minutes, sometimes minor 45, We'll come in and we'll ask our mentees, and I'll ask mine specifically, um, what trouble has happened in their life since the last time we got to. I mean, I'm there once a week, but you know, what would you like? And now they know I'm asking this question. I've been doing this for. I have kids that I started mentoring in fifth grade. They're in college now, and they'll still call. You know, that type of thing. And so they know this year's group of mentees. They know when I come, I'm asking this question. They, sometimes they come, Pastor, here's the things I want you to talk about with me. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is I have a room now, you know, of 11 kids mm -hmm. who are deemed the school's worst. I still do it. Uh, I didn't learn my lesson. Uh, <laughs> they're deemed the school's worst. But here's what's interesting is uh, by the third or fourth meeting, um, the group participates. So this child, and all of them do, you know, Pastor, I got in trouble because I, I couldn't be quiet in my class. And so I'll ask them, what could you have done better? Why weren't you able to be quiet? What happened? What did the teacher, did you feel like the teacher was ignoring you? Like I asked them the questions, how did you feel? So you're mentally taking them back to the event and then yes. walking them through yes. the different options. Yes, and then you'll have a kid over here who just got out of sack. Oh yeah, you should have done this. And I'm like, okay, that's good, but let me talk to him, you know? Yeah. So they're all participating. And it takes three or four times. Yeah. But by the end of the school year, I mean, you have a whole new set of kids. And, and um, I took a year off. This past year just I was having so many things going on with my church and community and the things that we do in that school were so impactful that at least for those set of kids the principal asked us to come back this year and I was like I'm not done taking my year off you know and she was like we, we need you please come back you're, you are the only and I'm not trying to say like I'm the only, only one. I understand what she was saying but you put the time in establishing a relationship yeah, with the kids. yeah. and so if you're not setting up the environment to hear what the emotional break, you'll never hear it. But if you get to that child and, and set it up to where, I'll, tell me two things good and one thing bad. And then celebrate the good things and then say, well, I want to talk about that thing you said. You yelled at your mom? How did you feel about that? What, what happened? Those, that's, why, that's why we're there, to help them do that. And so... That's how we set up those interactions. The second thing I would answer that is if you want to specifically help the teachers, then you can ask the, the teachers, I guess. I'm not sure how much time they spend with the teacher, but you can perhaps ask the teachers, uh, what kind of problems are you having in the classroom and how can we help you? And then in that way, I have one teacher. I used to have one teacher at, at Young Blood where I was. Uh, he would always stop me at the end of my mentoring session and say, hey, uh, one of your mentees is my student. <coughs> How can I get him to act like that with me in my class? And instead of telling him how to control him, I tell him, well, here's what I know. And I know this. And so I just started feeding him this information to how he can use. So I was, I guess, mentoring him, you know, um, without mentoring him, you know, that kind of thing. So does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Which book did you say this was? This one is Emotional Poverty. She has a lot of books. Uh, and she's, I mean, this woman is so passionate about this science. I mean, uh, she, it is a science. And, and it's, it, it really means a lot to me because um, when I was going through high school and I always knew I was going to go to seminary and I made it up to my master's level in seminary, there was always that part that was always involved in psychology and mm -hmm. psych, psychiatric health. So I was always studying that stuff. So a lot of the things that she talks about, I'm like, I know that, I know that. It's bringing back all these memories. I never got this deep with it. And so for her to uh, talk about the science behind this stuff, for me, it's just extremely passionate because I see this stuff every day in kids. And uh, to me, it's just exciting to see that, oh my God, she just, I just learned that. I just learned that last week, you know. 
Um, I don't use this one much, but the future story is in this environment when you're trying to calm them, um, a lot of times you want to talk to them about what can happen past this event. Let's, you know, let's go back in the room, let's finish the day, or perhaps even another day past this. Now you know this mark on your thing, you're going to be exempt, you're going to not be able to go to the peace party. Um, you're teaching the child how to think into the future so that they've earned it instead of, she didn't let me go, she don't like me. She kept me out of that thing, she doesn't like, no, it's not about me not liking you. You chose it. And so a lot of times uh, you, you can calm them down by giving them something to behave for in the future. I don't use it a lot, uh, but it is a tool. Tapping in touch. So in, uh, in the science of the brain, you know, we have these... Um, we have these pressure points, which really isn't known a lot in the Western world. Uh, we tend to go intra-thought. But in the Middle Eastern world and overseas, uh, they practice a lot of uh, acupuncture and pressure points, which it has proven to be very true. This stuff really works. And so um, a lot of times um, teachers, what she teaches is for teachers, uh, of course they can't touch the child, but they come up with activities where the child is touching their own pressure points and they just think they're doing an activity. So there's a, one activity that's called a chop, chop block or something, and there's pressure points in your hand that release calming. Uh, and so there's a game where you can chop to math like this uh, and, and massage your fingers to math. But yeah, do like that, that kind of stuff. Uh, tap, your, tap your temples and stuff, and it, it calms you. And the kids have no idea what you're doing. But you, as a student of it, you understand, you know what you're bringing into your classroom. And so that, that is one. The look up, I talked about. The breathing technique, you want to oxy oxygenate the brain. The faster you can get the blood flow to the brain to process that emotional response, the faster it will be over. Uh, in the feminine brain, as Ruby Payne uh, brings out, uh, processes emotion almost immediately uh, because their blood flow is across the region of the brain. But even though you can get them to breathe faster, you, uh, not breathe faster, that's hyperventilating, just breathe, uh, you'll help them process that quicker. For young men, uh, instead of brooding in a corner, uh, don't make them talk, but give them something to do. Just breathe with me. You don't have to talk. Just breathe with me. And then just take a few deep breaths, and I'm going to leave you over here. When you want to talk, come back and talk to me. Uh, now I've done this and that works and, and I have a good news club. I have a good news Bible club that I do uh, every Thursday And so I go pick up kids from two different schools and bring them to my church and we uh, have a Bible club There it's about 30 kids uh, Some from middle school and some from elementary school and uh, you know in every group of kids You're gonna have a few that that are like this and nine times out of ten um, What we'll do is we'll practice this breathing technique, especially if it's a young man and I'll go in the corner with him, and I'll tell him, you're not having a good day, huh? And no, I'm not. And uh, I don't need to know what happened, but let's go over here and talk. Let's go over here and sit down, and, and let's breathe. Copy my breathing. He'll copy my breathing. And I say, I'm going to leave you here, but I'm not leaving you here to be by yourself. I'm leaving you here until you're ready to tell me why you acted like that. And he'll sit there, and he'll see the other kids having fun, and he'll sit there for three, four minutes, and then Pastor Paris, I'm ready to tell you why I acted like that. Calm. As a, calm as a church mouse, you know. And he'll talk to me, and I'm like, thank you, thank you so much for explaining that to me. Uh, why you guys like that? Are you ready to rejoin your group? Uh, but before you do, what could you have done better? How could you have not done that before you go back to your group? And so that's that. Uh, the pat on your heart and tap your stomach, I don't remember what that is. I forget. And, uh, is that to distract your brain? I don't <laughs> no, right? Probably, I don't remember. <laughs> and uh, this one I don't remember either. I don't, I don't use these too much. Yet. Eye movement. Um, yeah. Yeah. But mm -hmm. once we kept the train, I was like, simplified. I was like, oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't use these two that much. I don't remember what those are. The others I use a lot. Uh, specifically, the water and the looking up. I use those quite a lot. So. I think the breathing one is pretty cool too because most of the time when you're in a crisis or stressful situation, you find, like even with me, I stop, I don't breathe well. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if you're in a panic mode. Yeah. So I think that's huge yeah. just to kind of get that oxygen, just like you were saying. Yeah. And yeah. bring you back to earth, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, uh, it helps your brain realize what you're going through. You know, we think of ourselves uh, as a person, when you go through something, I'm going through it right now. And when they do 
brain scans of people who are experiencing emotional trauma, you can actually see the progress of the brain lighting up to where, oh my God, it took her 15 minutes for her to fully realize what she went through. And for men, it's, uh, for the male brain, it's up to three hours or more for them to fully realize what has just happened. All they know at that moment is, I've been, I've been emotionally jolted. And so to the breathing, it helps you get that blood flow to the brain where you can process that quickly. I'm appreciative of you pointing out the male and the female too, just because there is a difference. There is a difference, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's helped us in our, especially with our ministry to homeless, uh, homeless youth. Uh, we deal with a lot of teenagers in our ministry. Uh, because that's mostly who's homeless without the, the, other, the McKinney Mental kids, the 100, so about 103 now. Um, it really helps us really minister to them because we do yearly, we do an end of the, end of the year interview with um, those 100 and some odd kids. And I have never had a young man show up to that interview. I've only interviewed young ladies. And I never understood why. And then when I went through this, I understood they, they, they don't know what to say. <laughs> so I asked the district, could I go to them instead of inviting them? Because the girls, they would come. <laughs> oh, you want me to talk? I got something to say. You know? <laughs> so they would come talk. But the young men would never talk. And I'm like, where are the boys at? There's so many young men that are homeless, and I would, I would expect for them to want to talk. No. And so I asked the district, would they give me permission to come and, and interview them during part of the school day? And they gave me permission to do so. And so we set up a classroom and we put food in there. And they would come. And when I provided the atmosphere for them to talk and over food, you'd be surprised at the stuff that came out of their mouth. But they would not come to me and talk. And so it just it helped me understand the difference between them being willing and ready to communicate. And nine times out of ten, that boy is not being quiet because he's being difficult. He's being quiet because he, he really doesn't know how to communicate how he's feeling. I mean, this helped me. I have two sons, uh, biological sons, and I have several others that I've come to know as sons. And it helps me, it has helped me be a better father to, to boys. Have you ever heard kids say that teacher don't like me? Okay. That's not always the teacher's fault. Okay? So kids will happily do work for teachers they feel like them. Happily turn it in on time, do the test, do the study, everything for teachers that they feel pay attention to them, like them. But for teachers that don't necessarily, they're a great teacher, but they're not emotional. They're not oh good job when you know they're not the pat on the back teacher. That child may feel useless in that class or unloved or ignored. How I've been able to direct my kids. Um, where's it at? Especially for that situation. You go here because if they if they start the precedent now of a low GPA or not passing their classes that follows them and it's not the teacher's fault now I mean you're graduating high school now and you failed classes you could have passed it's no one's fault that you're not getting accepted to these universities or technical schools you know you set for them a future outlook something for them to say I'm turning in these grades not for my teacher but for me right now they're at the age where they are associating that emotion with Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. And we need to help them understand this is for you. You need to be good at English because you can be. You're smart enough. To, you, be, you be for them what the teacher is not. And it's not the teacher's fault. Our teachers don't owe us anything but to teach us. But we do have some teachers that have the loving and, and a lot of school districts are actually hiring for that now. The, the, the teachers that are carrying in their class. <laughs> it is something that you have or don't. I mean, it just is. I That's think. so true. We, when I, before this position, I was in the high school level, and we would always have kids come in. Well, I hate that teacher. I, yeah. I and mean, that's why my grades are bad. And that's where why we go is definitely the future story because yeah. you don't. You'll have employees or coworker. I love. <laughs> but you'll have coworkers that you don't necessarily get along with, but you do have to make make do yeah. in the moment. So. Yeah, you have to. And so it's it's something that we have to learn that. And so I've learned that with the kids that I have with that. And I check I check report cards of my all my mentees every report card, and I see the same thing. You got all A's. Explain to me this F. And they'll sit and talk to me about it, and I can by the end of that semester. We can bring that grade up just by doing that with them.
Thank you so much.